Fabio. Oh, wow. He's carrying me. How are you doing, Brandon? I'm all right. What are you doing? You're reading some EGs? Yeah, I'm reading some some routines this morning, but there's this one um, possible discharge that I'm not really sure about, and I'm, I think I'm just going to guess it. Is it a did spike or oh. not? Well, I would recommend not just guessing, although mm. actually the old definition of epileptron discharges was essentially a guessing definition. So if you have a lot of experience, you've seen you know hundreds or thousands of patients who have epilepsy and who don't, then you know the definition is was epileptron discharges are waves that you see in patients who have epilepsy, but not in other patients. And that may be not the best definition to use for a trainee. So um, there's actually some guidelines that they can help you say the same things that other people would say when they see the same EEG. So I, I would recommend applying those guidelines, these oh, kind of official definition. I didn't know that. I think we should bring in uh, one of the experts here you from, from the Europe. Best. Well, I think you I hear our, our introduction. That case? Going. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's coming. Hi, Hello, Dr. Hey, Dr. Nice to see you. Yeah, SB yes. Q. Yeah, so um, this is based on an expert experience from decades, and the ISCN compiled them into the so-called operational criteria for epilepsy form discharges. So there are six criteria. Mm -hmm. So the first one is that, that your wave needs to be spiky. I mean, this is common sense and a pointed P. This is number one. Number two is about the duration of the wave. So you see the spiky thing, and then you measure the wavelengths, the duration. Mm -hmm. And then you compare it with the wavelengths, with the duration of the waves in the background activity. And then this must be different than the wave duration in the background. This is the number two. Mm -hmm. Now, number three is a little bit subjective, and I must admit that, that here we have a low inter-rater agreement, but it's about the symmetry of this spiky thing. So mm -hmm. the real epilepsy form discharges are usually asymmetric. So mm -hmm. either the upgoing slope is steeper than the down downgoing one or the other way around. Now mm -hmm. the non-epilepsy form sharp transients are more symmetric. But again, this has a low interrater. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I thought it was just being a spike and maybe having an aftergoing slow wave. I didn't know all the other criteria. That's interesting. Number four. Is, is the slow wave that is following the spiky thing, the spike or the sharp wave. And please note that it's immediately following the slow wave uh, uh, the spiky thing. It's, it's no return uh, to the background activity between the spike and the slow wave. So the following of the discharge, the following slow wave, that's number four. Mm -hmm. Now, number five is that the background activity is disturbed. Now, if it's after the uh, spiky thing, then it's uh, usually uh, low voltage, and high frequency activity, which mm -hmm. is instead of the slow wave. Sometimes, if you are lucky, you can see both number four and five, but then number five, the change in the background is before the spike. Mm -hmm. Now, number six is about the voltage distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so the negative and positive potentials on the scalp mm -hmm. must make sense from a biological point of view. And here I would like to refer to our episode number 10, to my recollection in the EEG talks when we use these um, uh, voltage maps to estimate the location. Mm -hmm. But let me emphasize that you can use this actually to distinguish the real epilepsy form discharges for, from some artifacts which, which can look spiky. Neuronal activity uh, in the cortex generates these return currents. And these neurons are just like the rocket propelled grenade firing negativity in one direction and positivity in the other direction. And then if you place these sources, these rocket propelled grenades, mm -hmm. uh, then you get different voltage distribution. So here you place it on the cortical convexity and then big grenade negativity and rest of the head is positive. But mm -hmm. if you place the rocket propelled grenade, the source into the wall of a sulcus, then they fa fire in parallel with the surface. So you have a negative pole here and a positive pole there. And when you look at voltage maps, you have these color codes. So blue is negative, red is positive. So again, RPG firing perpendicular to the surface. You have a negativity and then positivity around it. And then RPG firing in parallel with the surface in the wall of a sulcus. Then you have negativity and then you have the positivity. So these are from the brain. Again, the radial distribution, tangential distribution, look how regular they are. 
And then look how irregular these things are. Now, these are spiky artifacts. Mm -hmm. So, of course, not everything that is from the brain is a spike, but you can use the voltage map to distinguish whether a signal comes from the brain or from outside the brain, like a spiky artifact. And, and again, in 3D voltage maps, this is from the brain, this is not from the brain. And then also in two dimensional, this is from the brain. Look how regular they make sense physiologically and how irregular these are artifacts, spiky artifacts. Senator, I have a question from one of our EEG talkers. Um, what happens if you don't have a voltage map in your in your practice? Does that impact how you can use the six IF sign criteria? Then you, you, you have to look at, at your montages and you, you try to estimate where the negativities and the positivities are, which if you are a skilled eg -er, you can do just basically on, on, uh, on inspecting the montages. But the, the best is, is, of course, to look at, uh, look at the, the voltage maps. And, and you know, this, this is a trivial thing. So uh, from a computational point of view, this is not a challenge. And most of the EEG readers uh, already offer you this possibility, either in two dimensions or in three dimensions. Same information is there, I think, either way, whichever is available, you could mm -hmm. use it. These are computed at the peak of the spike? Yes, so if you look at single discharges, uh, then um, you have the best signal to noise ratio at the peak, so these are computed at the peak. Now, when it comes to the localization, then the onset is more important, uh, but then you need to average the um, individual discharges to get a better signal to noise ratio, but that's a different uh, topic that's about the, the uh, source estimation, the location. Yeah. But, but just for distinguishing artifacts from spiky artifacts from, from interictal epileptic form discharges, you can do it at the peak. So, so how many do you need really, uh, Dr. Benitsky? Just one of the six is enough? No, 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 no. Actually, uh, we looked at it in a systematic way. So here you can see a rock curve, mm -hmm. this, uh, receiver operating characteristic. Let, let, let me show you what this is. So okay. on the vertical axis, you have the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And then on the horizontal axis, you have one minus the specificity. So you can see this dotted line here. So everything that is to the left from this dotted line means that you have a specificity higher than 95%. And this is what we want because we want to avoid overreading EEG, misinterpreting, misdiagnosing epilepsy. So we want to stay on the left of this dotted line. And mm -hmm. you can see that if you are very, very picky, and if you accept a spike only if it has the perfect form, the archetypical form with all six criteria, mm -hmm. then of course you have a 100% specificity, but this is at the cost of sensitivity if you are so picky. Now, on the other hand, if, if you are very too, too liberal and then you say, okay, two of these criteria is enough, then you have, of course, a sensitivity of 100%, but a very, very low uh, specificity. So you would misdiagnose lots of people without epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So dotted line shows, uh, shows us the threshold for the specificity. So if you see a single discharge, then mm -hmm. you need at least five criteria to be on the safe side and avoid misdiagnosing, overdiagnosing mm -hmm. epilepsy. Okay. What's the gold standard uh, for this? In this study, we had an independent gold standard, and that was uh, the diagnosis from the epilepsy monitoring unit. So we actually recorded the habitual uh, episode of the patient, and then we know that the patient has epilepsy or does not have epilepsy. So okay. uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite certain, but of course, then you can discuss whether this is generalizable because not all patients end up in the epilepsy monitoring unit, but mm -hmm. at least very okay. certain. Okay. Right. And does it matter which ones you pick, Dr. Benitsky, when you say three, it could be one, it two, does. three? It does actually. Huh? So uh, on this <laughs> rock curve, uh, it's any criterion, but then we, mm -hmm. we looked which combination is most important important because not all criteria are created equal. I must say some of them have a higher interrater agreement, others have a lower interrater agreement, and then um, mm -hmm. some have higher diagnostic accuracy. So mm -hmm. the most heavyweight players uh, out of these six are mm -hmm. these, these following three. So of course it must be spiky, that's, that, that's a must. Mm -hmm. And then the following slow wave four, and the voltage map. This combination of the three criteria uh, is mm -hmm. most informative. Mm -hmm. So spiky, slow wave, and then a voltage distribution. Mm -hmm. Just a shout out to Dr. Corral, your, your PhD student, because he did a lot of this work, right, Dr. Benitsky? Right.
So uh, actually, uh, all these values that I'm, I'm going to show uh, you today are part of uh, uh, I could browse uh, PhD thesis. Yeah, that's awesome. All so, right. but these these were only uh, looking at a, a single discharge. So uh, mm -hmm. the ICM criteria are about a single discharge. But you know that's that's a kind of laboratory setting because you you, you never look at 10 seconds EEG or you, you look only in studies. But in reality, you look at 20, 30 minutes of, of routine, at least 20, 30 minutes of routine recording. Mm -hmm. So then the next question is how often you need to see this because the repetition rate is very very important and and again these results are common sense results mm -hmm. so the the less typical a spike is the more uh, the higher number you need in, uh, in a, a recording to, mm. to call the recording epileptic form mm -hmm. and then you can go down to three criteria but not not lower so mm -hmm. of course if you see these archetypical uh, spikes fulfilling five six criteria then you're on the safe side even with one discharge per recording mm -hmm. then you, if you have this heavyweight combination of one four six so only three criteria but this specific com combination of spiky mm -hmm. slow wave and voltage distribution then you need two in a recording mm -hmm. especially because you want to avoid this so-called slow fuse transients which, which can be tricky so if you see it just once in a recording then it, it can still be a slow fuse transient but if you see it twice it's 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 almost never uh, you, you very rarely can see twice a slow fuse transient in a recording mm -hmm. and then if it's less typical so it's only four uh, criteria satisfied, then you, you, you must see it at least four times in a recording. And then if it's three criteria, then at least five times in mm -hmm. a record. And you don't go lower than three mm -hmm. criteria. I feel like that's, Brandon, that's what we do usually, right? When you're reading an EEG, if you see it just when you're like, eh, but if you see a lot of them, it just decreases your threshold, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and basically, when, when I, I tell, I, I show these criteria to experienced old EG years, they say, okay, so what, we knew this uh, for, for, for a long time ago, but now we, we put some words behind it and we yeah. make it easier for, for the students to learn it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I learned it from, from Brandon. He's been reading EGs for like how many years now? 200 years, uh, Brandon? At least 200. At least. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so shall we get back old. to your, your EG that- you Yeah, let's to... take a look at that and some, some example. Oh, yeah, a little bit of pressure though. We just learned it, but we'll give it a shot. I think it is spiky. So criteria one, I would say is there. There is no okay. try. It doesn't have a slow wave really. Is it asymmetric? I always find that hard. To me, it looks symmetric though. So I would so no, no to number three. Two was, is the duration different from the background mm -hmm. of this wave? Uh, I think probably yes, it is different. And then let, um, me, let me show you. Let me show it to you in in, in a co common average. So yeah. look at this way. Blum, blum, blum. Okay, so never mind. I take it back. <laughs> Not different. Okay. And how about the how about the voltage map then? Ooh, looks nice. So yeah. this is this is from the brain. Brain. Yeah, yeah. So but we, have... we only mm -hmm. we only have two. So you mentioned only only number one, so spiky, mm -hmm. and then number six voltage map. Yeah. So two is I nothing. think one and six is right. Yep. Regardless how many times you see it, just two criteria, not enough. Okay. Yeah. But what, what, what is it though? Yeah, it's it's a pop-up of the background activity. And actually the many papers uh, from Salim Bembadis uh, and, and Bill Tatum show that actually this is the uh, normal variant, which is most guilty for overreading EG. So okay. this, you can call it a wicked wave. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the wicked rhythm because it's just one wave. This is the most common uh, cause of over. Mm, interesting. Yeah. 